Good morning. How are you? You look wonderful. Best looking audience I've talked to today. By a huge margin. No, uh, so I'm actually really, really excited this morning. And the reason is this is my first keynote ever. Thank you. Uh, the, the wonderful thing about keynotes is there's actually only one difference between a keynote and a normal talk, which is if you give a normal talk and it's not very good, people question the judgment of the speaker. But if you give a keynote and it's not very good, people question the judgment of the organizer. <laughs> it's a true story. So if you don't think this talk is very good, uh, you can talk to Nick. He's backstage. So this talk is called You Should Take a Codecation. You should take a codecation. Now, a codecation is like a vacation, only you spend most of your time writing code. So here is my four-step plan for how to take a codecation. Number one, you need to choose someone awesome to go with. Someone awesome. Or someone you think could be awesome. Number two, you need to choose somewhere you both want to go. Number three, you go to that place, but rather than spending the bulk of your time doing tourism type activities, you spend the bulk of your time writing code. Whatever kind of code interests you, whatever kind of projects tickle your fancy, whatever you're into, things you couldn't do at work, things you've always meant to get to, technologies you've always been curious about. And step four is you ship something. You need to finish something and put it out in the world. So I'm going to tell you the story of my first codecation ever. So one day I tweeted this. SICP stands for the Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. It is a classic textbook in computer science. It's an amazing book about programming. And the bits I've read have been awesome, but like most people, I haven't read all of it. And I was feeling uh, unimpressive, unimpressed with myself, I suppose. Uh, when I retweeted this, someone responded. Chris Hunt works at GitHub. I had to Google SICP. No shame there, that's okay. So I said this. You can read this in the back pretty well. Can't see it? Uh, so he said, I had to Google SICP. I said, let's get a cabin in the woods and not come out until we've done every exercise. And Chris, this is a, a ridiculous thing to say to a near stranger, of course. <laughs> so Chris responded as a normal, rational person and said this, which is not what you say if you're a normal, <laughs> rational person. It says, I would do this with you, which is ridiculous. So Chris and I started emailing, and we said, OK, Cabin in the Woods, reading SICP, that's very specific. What if we like, tweaked the details a little bit? And Cabin in the Woods, reading SICP, turned into a villa in Costa Rica, uh, writing Clojure, which is a Lisp that runs on the JVM. It's a great language. I highly recommend it. Um, so we went online, and we went on Airbnb, and we booked a place. And after we had paid money and this thing was planned, I was like, who is this Chris guy, though? So I had met Chris once at a conference. So we had like a, hey, that, I was like, hey, man, that was a nice talk. You did a good job. He's like, oh, thanks. And then maybe we tweeted at each other once or twice since then. But we barely knew each other. Um, one of the things I did know about Chris was that he can do this. Got those lights down. Yeah, thank you. Boom. So that's Chris's magic trick. I'm sure he appreciates your applause. <laughs> so 
that was one thing I knew about Chris. The other thing I knew about Chris was when I Googled him, I found the blog post announcing that he was now a GitHubber. And on this blog post, uh, they had attached this GIF. Oh, oh. Oh, you're killing me. This one. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the deal with it glasses. I was like, this is a guy I can get along with. And see, what I figured at this point was, this person has obviously spent a ton of time focusing on something very trivial. <laughs> He's probably an awesome programmer. <laughs> this is basically our job, right? Management of thousands of details. Clearly, Chris was into the kind of things I was into. And so um, we booked this thing, and we both hop on planes, and Chris gets there first. And I land in Costa Rica, and I get in a uh, shuttle to the place, and it's about an hour from the airport to our Airbnb, uh, during which I come the closest I've ever come to dying in a car accident. Literally. This is a truck decides to pass someone into our lane, and I was watching us go at highway speeds at a truck head on, also at highway speeds, which was pretty terrifying. But I survived, and I made it to the Airbnb. Yes, thank you. <laughs> By the way, I love interruption. Feel free to heckle. Feel free to comment, ask questions. Uh, this doesn't have to be a lecture. Love it. Um, and so I reach the Airbnb, and Chris informs me of a discovery he had made, which is on Airbnb, uh, the way it lists spaces, it says accommodates two. And what this place meant by accommodates two is uh, accommodates two people sleeping in the same bed. Yes. So, uh, starting on my very first night, I began sharing a small bed with a stranger. Yeah, TMI. That's where it stopped. Don't worry, we'll stop there. No, the good news is that Chris is one of the most polite people in the world uh, and was a perfectly good bedfellow. <laughs> Literally. Uh, so, what we would do is we would get up in the morning and figure out breakfast, and then we would write code because in Costa Rica it's really hot during the day. So we'd write code for most of the day. Uh, we would sit on our porch. Uh, we had this really nice villa, and the porch sort of came out into the rainforest so that in the morning we mornings we would see the monkeys going down from the trees to the feeding area, and in the evening they would come back up through the trees, which is amazing. And so we would write, we wrote ClojureScript, which is a closure that compiles into JavaScript. It's a Lisp, compiles into JavaScript. It's a wonderful language. If you're, if you're still writing JavaScript, I recommend you switch to ClojureScript instead. It's fabulous. Uh, and so we did some tourism stuff, but we mostly programmed. And I'm going to show you what we did. This is the first thing we did. We made Game of Life. And I'm going to show you a glider. Woo! And this is running for real in the browser, real JavaScript. Things are happening. This is not a simulation. I mean, it is a simulation of life, but it's not real. Let's, let's generate a big, a big field with a bunch of stuff. Hey, hey, it works. By the way, there's a game of life uh, description in those little booklets they have in the, the, the gear sack they gave us. So we did this, and we were feeling pretty pumped. Uh, and so we went into some other stuff. And then we decided to make a maze generator and solver. I had seen Jamis Buck's talk at RubyConf, I think it was, uh, and found it really interesting. And so we built this. Now, this is a randomly generated maze and a um, depth first search solve. And what we're trying to do is go from the top left to the bottom right. And the green is the path that we're searching on right now, and the red is when we've determined we're at a dead end and we need to back up. So every time the search backs up, it highlights it, the colors are red. I think this is super cool. So we ship both these things, and we built a thing. So I said step four is ship, so we put them out in the world, and we built this page. We called our experience Closure Rica. <laughs> yeah. This is us on the beach. This is a little map of where we were, very far from home. Oh, yeah. Can we turn the lights down again? I saw Nick walking around. I wonder if we still have a light person. <laughs> I don't. Oh, there you go. Cool. Us on a beach, a map of where we were, some beautiful pictures. There's Game of Life. It's reached a steady state. This happens a lot with Game of Life. We went on a horseback ride. That's the view from the horse. First person horse shooter. And there's our maze. Now, these things are all open source. You can go check out the code for them. They're under the um, Codecation organization on GitHub. 
we do everything on GitHub because Chris works there, so he's kind of obsessed with it. Uh, I want to show you something. So this, is what, this, this maze is what happens when you generate a maze using depth-first search. So the rough algorithm is basically um, we build a maze that's all walls, and then we start at the top left, and we start busting down walls and trying to get to the end. And if we uh, get stuck, we back up. So that's a depth-first search generation and a depth-first search solve, meaning we, just, we try to go as far as we can, and if we get stuck, we back up a little bit and then keep going, and back up a little bit and keep going. And so uh, we made a, a, a change, or Chris made a change to this to allow different search and generation strategies. This is how good Chris is at GitHub. Look at this pull request. So this allows depth first or breadth first search. And he gave examples of what he had done. So here is the uh, depth first search generation, but a breadth first search solve. So breadth first is where you look at all your options and you descend a little bit, and then you look at all your options, and you descend a little bit, as opposed to de deep diving as far as you can and then backing up. You sort of go as wide as you can at first. So this is a depth first search, search, depth first search generation and a breadth first solve. This is a, <laughs> a breadth first for both. You can see the maze looks ridiculous. And the solving is about as go is pretty darn goofy. This is, you can really see the breadth first uh, search here. This makes it really clear like what we're doing. Like it goes just, just one thing at a time and then goes back and checks all its options. Love it. And then here is a breadth first generation, but a depth first solve. Yeah. Good algorithm. <laughs> Feel free to use this. This is some advanced game AI right here. Cool. So yeah, so you can look at any of this, and uh, I hope you do. So this is our first codecation. Oh, and here's the classic. This is the one that you've already seen. So this was an amazing experience. And after this, I was totally sold. I was like, we got to do this again. So we started planning the next codecation. And so uh, I said, hey, Chris, you should, let's, let's figure out some spots to look at. So he, of course, opened an issue on the codecation slash trips repository. Like, literally, we do, it's, it's kind of crazy. Um, a little GitHub says, let me again show you how good Chris is at GitHub. Here is his issue he opened. <laughs> Less urban than Denver, Boulder offers miles of beautiful hiking trail, <laughs> while still offering fast internet and organic coffee. It's a nature-loving hipster's paradise and the perfect location for fall codecation 2014. <laughs> September is a critical time for USA climate. We can travel north and freeze our asses off, or we can head to south into balmy 90 degree humidity. Average high temperatures. Boulder manages to, manages to sit between 50 Fahrenheit and 80 Fahrenheit in September with low humidity, offering a luxurious climate for urban and nature exploration. This is the calendar with the average temperatures. Activities. <laughs> These are the hiking trails. These are the swimming holes. These are the B-cycle rental locations. This is how much it costs. This is Denver. On the way out of town, why not stop in Denver for a day? And we did. Here's the Airbnb. Notice this. For $12.75, we can stay in a great location with two beds. <laughs> Such luxury. I can't believe we can afford that. Uh, these are the airfare maps from both, for both of us. And uh, I, of course, said yes, because how do you say no when someone puts something together like that? Uh, and so I'd like to show you uh, what codecation looks like a little bit more, uh, more live. It looks kind of like this. Without it. 
this is going to totally shock you, but I updated to iOS 8 before the trip. Not that you could tell. It's a time lapse. Anybody with me? All right. Great. Uh, so that's what uh, programming looks like if you speed it up. And it turns out I do all kinds of interesting sort of yoga-ish poses. And also Chris works harder than I do, you can tell. So what did we build uh, on Codecation in Boulder? Well, we, I, we had gotten to Boulder, and we were like, uh, ClojureScript was awesome last time. It was super fun. What if uh, this time we took it, sort of cranked it up a notch, and we built uh, multiplayer Pong in ClojureScript in the browser? Uh, and that sounded pretty cool. But while we were there, I got an email from a company called Olife. Does anybody know Olife? Yeah, so Olife is, uh, was a journaling service. And what Olife did is every day they would send you a prompt, which is, how did your day go? And you, you would just reply to the email and hit send, and they would get that email, parse it, and turn it into a journal entry. Uh, and then the cool thing was, every time they sent you that prompt for to write, to write, they would choose one of your old entries at random and include it in the email and say, remember this, 205 days ago you wrote this, which is a really cool thing. It's a really smart trick because it makes you excited to open the email it makes you realize how interesting it is to read your old entries and encourages you to, encourages you to write more. And so uh, while I was, we had just arrived and I got an email saying, Olife is shutting down. So Olife was a uh, Y Combinator company and apparently they didn't, it didn't work out. And so they said, we, can't, we haven't made any money and we don't have enough users, so we're going we're gonna to shut the site down. Now I've been using Olife for two years. I have uh, hundreds of entries in it. And this daily journaling habit has been really powerful for me because I will found that I can do things like look back over the entries I've written and learn interesting things about my life. Uh, recently, after ending a relationship, I went back and read the, all those entries. And it was fascinating to see, like, wow, I was worried about this thing from the beginning. Or, wow, there's like six negative entries for every one positive entry. Like, this maybe wasn't a mistake. There, there, there was a real thing here that I had to deal with. Uh, and so I didn't want to lose this habit. And so I was sitting in a coffee shop with Chris on our, I think, our second day, and I turned to him and I was like, you know, dude, we should, uh, we should build a replacement for this because I don't want this to go away. And I described what it was to him, and he's like, yeah, all right, let's do it. So we ended up writing Ruby using Rails, and we started this mad dash because we wanted to build something uh, that would be in place by the time Olaf shuts down, which is tomorrow. Um, and we figured, you know, as long as we're doing this, there's no way that I'm the only person that wishes this wouldn't go away. So how about we build this and we have the ability for people to sign up too. We'll charge a little bit of money. It's, we charge $3.99 a month, and we, we sort of provide the same service and let people continue this daily journaling habit. And so we did. We built it. It took us, that's what that time lapse is. We're building, we called it Trail Mix. Uh, we, got, we got the sweet domain trailmix.life. Do you know that life was a TLD? I think that's pretty awesome. So uh, there was a bag of Trail Mix on the table. I was like, we should name it something in this place. And ah, boom, Trail Mix. It almost got called Noodle. Uh, I think trail mix is better. Uh, so it's trail mix life, and uh, we shipped it. Uh, it took us about three days, full time, working our butts off. We were doing honestly like 12 hours of programming a day, but like loving it, like having a super good time. Um, and we shipped it to ourselves after three days, and we used it for a day. And then we shipped it to the full world after the fourth day. Uh, we had we had a, like a launch email list, and so we emailed people. We had about 50 people on the list, and a bunch signed up. Um, and people have continued to sign up. And it was amazing. So we, we took this little codecation and ended up building this sort of small, interesting app slash business. And it was really wonderful. And the, so you could say for sure that we ship something because the world can use this, this site. The thing that we haven't done is shipped it in an open source sense. And so I'm going to do that right now. So let's make this repository public. Here we go. Boom. Thank you. There it is. Codecation organization. Trail Mix is the app. Uh, feel free to go check it out. I hope you do. I hope it's useful to you. By the way, if you're not interested in journaling as a personal endeavor, it's actually interesting as well as in a professional endeavor. So have you ever had the experience of getting an error message and saying, oh my god, I totally fixed this before. What was this? Like, I've seen this before. I know there's some way to do this. If you keep a really short, to the point development journal where you just write down when you fix something, or you, you, oh, that's right, this error means this. Just a quick note, 
You can go back and search that. It doesn't matter how you do it. Even if you just throw in a text file, I think you'll appreciate this habit. But if you're interested in having something prompt you to do it, because the hard thing I've found about journals is remembering to do them, building an actual habit. So consider using this for a development journal if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, so that was my uh, second codecation. And so I want to go a little bit more in detail into codecation uh, advice, specifics about how to have a really good one. Uh, the first one is I recommend you get a house. Uh, and the reason is that is it's nice to have your own place. So a hotel room, if you look at a hotel room, it's like 80% bed because the assumption is you're basically going to sleep there and you're going to be out and about most of the day. That's not really true if you're writing code most of the day. So it's very nice to have more space and have the creature comforts of an actual house. So I recommend doing that. I recommend um, one bed per person, uh, ideally. I mean, it was fine. It ended up being like a non-issue. It makes for a good story, but in reality, it was like, it was cool. It was no big deal. We got to know each other. So number one, get a house. Um, and, number and part of the reason a house is great is because it has a kitchen. So I recommend you don't waste a lot of time on food. It's one of those things when you go traveling to a new place, you have to figure out meals three times a day, and it eats up a surprising amount of time because you don't know where anything is. So when Chris and I were in Boulder, we would just shop every day. We'd go to the grocery store once a day and get all the food we needed for that day, and we would cook our meals. And it was really fast, and it was efficient, it was healthy, we felt really good about ourselves. Uh, so that's, really, that's, that's a really good uh, tweak we made there. We didn't do that in Costa Rica, and, and we suffered for it. And another thing is exercise a lot. So that, that's another thing we made time for every day. We were writing a ton of code, but we also would get out and go to like a nearby field and like do like calisthenics. We went to CrossFit a couple times. Uh, we jogged a little bit. I recommend like taking that really seriously. And the great thing about these codecations is it's kind of a chance to live your life the way you wish you did all the time, because there's sort of no constraint. There's no constraints, and there's nothing vying for your time. So it's like I want to eat really well. I want to exercise every day. I want to write interesting code with a cool person. And like that's all I did for 10 days in Boulder, and it was totally wonderful. And the final thing is, uh, sh well, two final things. One is, the last one, ship. Ship something. I think it's really important that you get something out in the world. Uh, I think that page we put together that has the stuff we have there, the open sourcing, um, delivering the app, open sourcing the app, I think that's a really huge component of it. You want something to show the world. I think that, that really puts the period on the end of the trip and says, like, I did a thing, and here's that thing. Anybody can see it. I think that's great. And then finally, uh, consider, <laughs> consider this all the time, but in Boulder, I started meditating. I'm using an app called Headspace, which kind of helps you build the uh, meditation habit. They give you, their onboarding process is like 10 minutes of meditation a day for 10 days. It's guided, it gives you, there's a little audio file that plays, it sort of tells you what to be doing. And I haven't ever felt calmer. And who knows if it was the exercise or the work or the focus, uh, but I really have noticed an amazing improvement in my own mood regulation and attention. I was less nervous front, before this talk than I ever have been for a talk. I felt really calm. Maybe it's that, maybe it's not, but it's probably worth trying. I think you should check it out. Uh, so, third codecation. This is the last one I did. I actually just finished this yesterday. I flew from my last codecation to here. Um, and that was with uh, the ThoughtBot, the team at ThoughtBot. And so we said, okay, this, I said to myself, these codecations are working really well with two of us. I'm getting a lot done, I'm loving it, I'm having great experiences. Would it work at work as well? So we did a little bit differently. We got seven people. I put them in a house, and the, these people were on the team for Upcase, uh, which is a product I run at ThoughtBot. And Upcase is kind of like a blend between code school and exorcism put together. We have uh, videos that get fairly advanced on Ruby and Rails, uh, but also an exercise system where you complete challenges but on your computer and then push them up for community review, and you review them in sort of a GitHub pull request style review system. And so we wanted to work on some features for that, and so we got this team together, and we formed little teams out of that team in the house, and it actually worked really well. So this, this works great with larger teams as well, as too. I think a lot of the benefit is just the focus. It's that you're all in the same physical location, it's that nothing else is going on, and you can just crank on stuff. And I really enjoyed it. Now, one of the things we do, this is a slight digression, but I think you'll appreciate it. One of the things we do uh, for Upcase is we produce a show called The Weekly Iteration. So each week, uh, Joe, our CTO, and I um, create a roughly 15 minute show about uh, mostly advanced Ruby topics. And we, screw up a lot. So our producer, Tom Obarski, cut together a blooper reel of some of our better uh, screw-ups. And that's what I'm gonna show you right now. He called it 40 episodes of nonsense because we'd shot 40 of them. I'm just gonna show you a minute or two of this. Hello. 
Hello and welcome to the weekly iteration, the show where we talk about things. Usually. Often. Hello and welcome. This is used. All right, are you ready? Ready. Okay. Hello and welcome to the weekly iteration. Today we are going to be walking you through contributing to an open source library. This is a request from someone on the forum. I should find out who it is in the forum. That'd be better. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the weekly iteration. Today we are going to be making an open source. I just need a minute. <laughs> Good to go. Are we screen flowing? Oh, my screen is flowing. Let me just check if that's yeah. true. <laughs> true. Oh yeah, that's one minute of this nonsense so far. So far. So far. Hello and welcome to the weekly iteration. Today we are going to be talking about one of my favorite oh my topics, God. which is how to turn a mic on. Oh, I so beat you to that one. Damn it. Yeah, absolutely. Can't give it all away. All right. Okay. What do you got for us? Okay. Uh, well, here's a terminal. <laughs> <laughs> here's a terminal. Yeah. So you use the terminal. I uh, use it daily. Okay. Sometimes not on the weekend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do you do in the terminal? No, I, have to, I need a minute. Yeah. Uh, oh man, I thought that was good. We were, we were in. Were we? Yeah. All right. Your terminal was such a good start. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's us screwing up a lot. Happens quite frequently. Okay, so I hope that I have convinced you indirectly on the virtues of doing stuff like this, doing a codecation and trying this out. Uh, just in case it's not obvious uh, what the benefits are to me, I think this is really important for us to do because we can. Because we have a profession where there's an opportunity to play. Now, there are not a lot of professions where you can do this. If I had instead tweeted, you know, I just want to find, if I were a surgeon, uh, I just want to find a cabin in the woods and just operate on people <laughs> until, you know, I just feel awesome at gallbladder surgery. Uh, I probably would get arrested. So it's, it's not everybody that can do this. I think we're incredibly lucky to be able to do this. And so because we have that privilege, I think we should take it. And I think you should take a codecation. And if you do, I would love to hear about it. My, honestly, the, the greatest thing I could hear from this talk is that like two people met at this conference and did this thing. It doesn't have to be so broad in scope as we did. It could be something small. It could even be a day. But if you do, I would love to hear about it. And uh, good luck. Thank you.